Hey there, y'all. This is Jordan from Madtown Studios. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Drawing the Facts, in which case I draw while giving you the facts. Compared to the previous episode, this video is a little bit more lighter, a bit more fun, and colorful. No pun intended. But before we get started, if you're new to the Madtown community, welcome. If you want to make it official, click on the subscribe button down below. Make sure to like, comment, and share. So normally I don't do this for drawing the facts, but for this topic and video, I'm going to throw in my own sketchy opinion. As we go further into the video, I will explain more as well as explain why I wanted to do this drawing. Oh, and one last thing. I promise this is the last one. For this video, I will be doing something very different. Usually I draw using color pencils as well as sketch pencils. But today, I'm going to draw using sketch markers. I've never drawn using markers, well, except back in kindergarten. But I have seen a lot of folks use markers for their artwork. So I'm going to test out these babies for the first time as well as using these drawing pens. All right, with all that being said, let's take a deep dive into these facts on mermaids. This was drawn the facts. Angel of the Sea. So to start things off, Let's begin with some facts on mermaids. So of course, you all probably know what mermaids are. Half girl, half fish, laying down gracefully on rocks as waves splash behind them. But mermaids actually go either further into the past some of the earliest legends of mermaids actually came from ancient Syria. Ancient stories dates back to 1000 BC. That's a really long time. One of the Syrian stories actually involved a goddess named Atargatis. Who wanted to be transformed into a fish? But when she dove into the water, only her bottom half was transformed. This, of course, started the figure of what is known as the mermaid. Top form being human, and the bottom half being a fishtail. Did you also know that mermaids weren't always thought to be as beautiful creatures? Sailors would actually mistake manatees to being mermaids. This would cause mermaids to get the conception of being ugly and fat. But they are adorable, come on. There are over hundreds of accounts of mermaid sightings and they were depicted without question in historical accounts. However though, most of these encounters had to be nothing more than just sea creatures, including dolphins, and as I said before, manatees. While some sailors see either mermaids as being beautiful angelic beings or just nasty looking sea cows other sailors consider mermaids to be bad omens when a sailor spotted a mermaid it usually meant that the voyage was headed into some dangerous territory In fact, expanding onto this, another creature that's similar to mermaids, but not quite, 
are known as the Greek sirens, who possesses extraordinary levels of beauty and charm. But unlike mermaids are seen to be pure and good, sirens have some more uh, messed up intentions. They're more treacherous. In which case, their goal is to entrance men with their beautiful singing voice, only for them to crash into rocks and perish. You know, while it is pretty cool that mermaids have the ability to swim underwater, as well as being, you know, half animal, they also have some other abilities as well. Some other superhuman powers include immortality, telepathy, hypnosis, and the ability to see into the future. It's not all just Aquaman powers. Mermaids are also the ones who have created ocean gemstones, such as the aquamarine. It has been said that aquamarine is made by mermaid tears, and it's therefore has the ability to protect sailors while they are on ocean. So yeah, just sit a mermaid down, have them watch a sad flick, and a uh, hey, cha-ching. It's also been said there's actually four types of mermaids. You have the traditional mermaid, who are able to reside in the ocean, but will at times also come up on land. Then you also have mermaids known as selkies, which actually came from Irish folklore. They're able to shed their tails in favor of human legs. Then there's shape-shifting mermaids, who are able to change into a human form and back into a mermaid form at any time. But a group of mermaids are actually known as merfolk. In which case, they have more of a human shape that allows them to live on land and in the sea. And also, I guess you really want to call a male mermaid a mermaid. That should be called a merman. Not to be political, but you know, that's how they say it. Another superpower that I forgot to mention is something called the mermaid kiss. It's been said that a kiss from a mermaid gives, gives you the ability to breathe underwater. It's unclear if the receiver of the kiss simply inherits this magical ability or if they sprout some gill somewhere in their bodies, which would be kind of weird, but also kind of cool. And another super ability that they have is the fact that their tails are able to change colors based on their mood. So kind of think of it as a mood ring, but on your bodies. And also too, mermaids, just like any girl you've met, love to accessorize. Some of their favorite jewelry pieces are shell crowns, pearl necklaces, conch hats, and kelp bracelets. They must have went to Jared. Mermaids is now we jump into The Little Mermaid, the story that started it all. But not the movie though, not that yet. We're actually gonna talk about the original Little Mermaid story, which was created by author Hans Christian Andersen from Denmark, which was published in April 7th, 1837. Now, some of you may already know the original story of the Little Mermaid and can definitely see some differences 
compared to the 1989 animated film. But for those who don't know about the original story, here are some facts. And actually, <laughs> these facts are pretty dark. So uh, buckle up. First fact, did you know that in the original Little Mermaid story, the main character, which was had no name, which was just the Little Mermaid, she wasn't allowed to rise up to the surface. And not only that, but it was actually a fad for mermaids at that age to suffer through eight oysters attached to their tails. As her grandmother, and yes, in this story, she does have a grandmother, she has stated that pride must suffer pain. I guess in a way, it's like an ear piercing for your foot. And twice more painful. Another fact, which is also pretty dark, is that her older sisters, who actually did get the chance to experience surface on land, actually sing about the joys of sailors. Drowning. That's right. The Little Mermaid's numerous of older sisters actually took great pleasure into seeing drowning humans. They were actually, their personalities were almost close to sirens. Apparently one of their chief pastimes is singing the sailors, trying to show them that it was nothing to fear of being underwater. And that was actually quite fun. Not really have much knowledge that humans do need air to breathe and to live. Another thing from the original Little Mermaid is that mermaids actually don't have souls. Back to the fact that they're actually immortal, they can live up to 300 years. But once they die, they're absolutely gone. In fact, they will dissolve and turn into sea foam after they're dead. While humans, on the other hand, while being mortal, will live again after death but in a more divine way, up in heaven. This was explained to the Little Mermaid from her grandmother. And this is also one of the reasons as to what makes the Little Mermaid so interested on humans and human life, as well as making that ultimate decision. Also compared to the animated version, after the Little Mermaid rescues the prince, and brings them onto land. The Lord Mary gets scared off by some women from the Covenant. They come over and find the prince and bring him back to his palace. This is pretty different from the animated version since it's um, a group of women and not his sheepdog. But back to the dark stuff. Later on in the story, the Lord Mary goes off to see the sea witch. In which, by the way, is pretty different from Ursula. In which case, Ursula is a straight up bad guy. The witch is a little bit more neutral. Also compared to the animated version, while Ariel only has three days to get true love's first kiss from Prince Eric in order to remain a human before turning back into a mermaid and possibly being Ursula's slave, in this story, she has to convince the prince to marry her, or else she will die. And to make it even more worse, there is no magical way for her voice to be taken away. But instead, the witch literally takes a scalpel and cuts off the mermaid's tongue. Oh, <laughs> but the pain doesn't stop there. Because it gets... Uh, yeah, it gets even more interesting. When she comes up to land and she has fully transformed into a human, she's not only voiceless, but she faces what the sea witch describes as walking on knives. That's right. Every step that the mermaid takes feels like she's stepping on knives. Her feet will bleed 
and she will face total agony and pain. Love hurts. It really does. Now this part is actually messed up, but also a little bit sad. And we haven't gone to the actual sad part. You see, unlike Prince Eric from the animated film, the prince from the original story wasn't some nice guy. Instead, he was actually kind of a... I mean, he really treated her like a literal pet. After the prince takes in the mermaid, he instead lets the mermaid sleep on the foot of his bed like a dog and calls her his little foundling. He says that he loves her as if he would love a little child, which is definitely not creepy at all. No, no. Uh. There are also, at least in some versions, in which case the mermaid would be serving as not really a slave, but definitely as a worker in the palace. So not being treated as a guest, but more as an employee, part of the staff really. However though, in the story, she is able to accompany the prince in some of his um, escapades, which she is completely fine with. So, you think things are going to go uphill from here? <laughs> nope, quite the opposite, because this is when things get actually even more depressing. So, of course, unlike the animated version, in which case, you know, Ariel will end up with the prince. She doesn't. For you see, the woman that actually found the prince on land actually happened to be a neighboring princess, at least in some versions would say. So because of this, he falls in love with her immediately and they quickly get married. Much to the mermaid's despair, not only was she going to lose her chance of being human and gaining an immortal soul, but she was going to die. And worst of all, she was going to be the third wheel. In the story though, the mermaid's older sisters actually do find out about what has happened. They make a deal with the sea witch to exchange their long, beautiful hair for a knife and wish to give to the mermaid sister. In order to live and become a mermaid again, she must stab the prince in the heart and have his blood fall onto her feet. However though, in the end, while the prince is asleep with his wife, she realizes that she cannot do it. So for that, she accepts her fate, jumps off the ship, and dissolves away. However though, in she does not die, but instead she actually does gain a mortal soul. She does float up into heaven and accepted as being the daughter of the air. And that's good, right? I mean, it's kind of a happy ending, at least a bittersweet ending, right? Well, just to put one more nail on the coffin, while she does fly around the world to do good deeds for 300 years, she actually gets some points added, in which case her sentence is shortened. However though, it's also been said too that any child that misbehaves or cries, more years is added. So uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that bittersweet ending just came to a bitter, bitter ending. All right, let's talk a little bit about the drawing itself. So as you're starting to see, this is my own version of the Little Mermaid story. As you can also see as well, it is loosely based off not just the Disney version, but also I'm also taking some references from the new live action version. 
That includes making the mermaid herself look a bit like Holly Bailey. And in terms of the coloring of this, I hope the marker is really able to really give it that vibrant and almost watercolor-like effect. Like I said, this is my first time using this, so yeah, here goes nothing, right? All right, now that we talked about the OG mermaid, now it's time to discuss Disney's version of the mermaid. But I'm not gonna talk too much about the movie because, well, it's The Little Mermaid. It's an animated classic. Everyone knows about it. Every child, their parents, their grandparents, their siblings, friends, uh, dogs, cats, goldfishes, especially the goldfishes, know about this movie. And it will definitely stand the test of time. However though, I am going to give you some behind the scene facts on The Little Mermaid. So here it is. To start things off, let's talk about one of the most iconic Disney villains or villainesses, Ursula the Sea Witch. Did you know that Ursula is Sicilia, which is a mythical hybrid of a human and an octopus? However though, if you actually watch this character, you might notice that she actually doesn't have eight tentacles, but instead has six. Even stated by her voice actress, Pat Carroll, she is mostly more similar to a squid than an octopus. Another fun fact about Ursula is the fact that she is based off of the drag queen model, Divine. Another fun fact actually involves Ariel's Grotto. If you take a look in the part of your role sequence, you can actually see some very popular figures. Some of the Easter eggs include a bust of Abraham Lincoln on one of her shelves, as well as a famed painting of Magdalene with a Smoking Flame by Georges Delatour. Also speaking more about Part of Your World, well, it is one of the most nostalgic songs ever. It will bring you joy, it will bring you tears. It is an amazing musical number. But did you also know that this song almost didn't see the light of day? In fact, during one of the screenings, which was viewed by younger audiences, some of the executives were having some second thoughts, especially after one child actually spilled a bucket of popcorn. That was a huge sign, a huge omen that this song wasn't going to cut it. Okay, well, at least the executives were thinking that. However, though, Howard Ashman, the lyricist for The Little Mermaid, who actually has passed away in 1991, and Alan Menken, the composer, who still is pretty active today, and of course, Glenn Key. Okay, I'm sorry, I gotta stop doing that. Uh, yeah, Mr. Keen, who was the character designer and lead animator for Ariel, all three have fought to try to get this scene into the film. Luckily though, during the second screening, the executives actually did change their mind. The song was kept into the film, and the rest was history. Now, every animation in this film is done just so perfectly. But there's actually two things I actually want to talk about. One of them is being the CGI. If you notice in the opening, the ship has been done in CGI, computer animation. 
But it actually wasn't until Rescuers Down Under that Disney decided to use a computer program called CAP, C-A-P. Another element that you see in Little Mermaid, which is under, completely understandable, is the bubble effects. However, though, did you know that instead of trying to draw and animate each individual bubble, which would probably take even longer, due to limited resources, Disney actually outsourced the animation bubbles. This actually can be seen in The Little Mermaid to Pacific Rim Productions, according to the book, The Political Economy of Disney, The Cultural Capitalism of Hollywood. Sounds like a positive book. So do you want to know what Ariel and Aladdin have in common? Okay, other than being teenage protagonists in their films and having both of their names starting with the letter A, it's also because they're modeled after Hollywood celebrities. While Aladdin was modeled after Tom Cruise, Ariel is modeled after Alyssa Milano who was known for playing a big role in the show, Who's the Boss? Sources also say that she was also based on Alice from Alice in Wonderland, giving her a more youthful appearance. And while this hasn't been confirmed by the artists and employees from Disney, people have speculated that Ariel and Hercules are related, making them cousins. Given that Zeus is Hercules' father and King Triton is the father of Ariel and is the son of Poseidon, which, in case Poseidon is Zeus's brother, that will make them first cousins. Now going back to more hidden cameos, other than Ariel's grotto, there's also a scene during the beginning of the film, in which case you can see in the crowd of the merfolks, you can see the heads of Goofy, Donald, Ed, and Mickey. You can also see Kermit the Frog, Mr. Limpet, and the Duke and the King from Cinderella. And just another hidden Mickey, if you look at the scene where Ariel's looking at the contract, you'll see uh, three circles in the contract, which of course is none other than the mouse himself. Another amazing fact, which actually involves the achievement of The Little Mermaid, is that it actually won an Oscar for Best Original Musical Score. And for original music of Under the Sea. And what makes this even more interesting is the fact that this is Howard Ashman and Alan Menken's first animated musical movie. They have worked on no other movie. Most of their projects have been successful musicals, including Little Shop of Horrors and Smile. Which, by the way, Jodie Benson, who does the voice for Ariel, actually worked on Smile, collaborating with the two. And finally, just like most successful Disney movies, Disney produced a lot more Little Mermaid related projects, including a TV series, two sequels, a couple of video games, of course guest appearances in Disney parks, even a Broadway musical. And in late 2019, it also been confirmed that The Little Mermaid will also will be getting the live action reboot treatment. And that of course is gonna lead me to my sketchy opinion. Okay, maybe before I start to give my own sketchy opinion, I guess maybe I should give some more information about this new live action remake, reboot. 
retelling, uh, whatever you want to call it. So not a lot of information has been confirmed. However, though, since July of 2019, it has been stated that singer Holly Bailey, not Holly Berry, a lot of people get that confused, Holly Bailey from the musical group Chloe and Holly will be playing the role of Ariel. I also says to the director will be Rob Marshall, who actually has spent the last couple of months meeting with talent and has stated that Bailey was a clear front runner from the beginning. Other castings for this movie includes Jacob Tremblay from The Room playing Flounder, Aquafina playing a uh, gender swapped Scuttle, and Melissa McCartney playing the role of Ursula. And rumors apparently are true that actor Javier Bourdain will be playing King Triton and not Terry Crews. That man cannot get a break, can he? As well as for Prince Eric, it will not be given to Harry Styles, but it will be given to Jonah Har King from Little Women and World on Fire. In terms of the music, they'll keep the original songs, but there will be some new songs added. And Alan Macon will be teaming up with Lynn Manuel Miranda. Now, the last news on production was actually from March, in which case they were actually starting in London. But of course, production came to a halt due to the pandemic. Now they're saying that the current release date will be November 19th for next year, 2021. But due to this whole uh, virus situation, it could even extend to 2022. The story itself looks like it's going to be the same, but articles including Digital Spy have stated that it will be updated for a 21st century. Which leads some people to be cautiously optimistic. And this would kind of make sense since Disney also launched a new initiative to include more women, people of color, and the LGBTQ folks. But yeah, though, that's what we mostly got in terms of the movie itself. However, though, some of the things you're hearing now that really has nothing to do with the movie itself mostly involves the main actress playing Ariel, Holly Bailey. And this is when I throw in my two cents. All right, so here is my sketchy opinion on the Little Mermaid remake. Unscripted. So the first to start things off, it's a remake. And if you see any of my sketchy opinion videos from the past, I am not a big fan of remakes or reboots. No re-rees. I am a big supporter of doing more original, more creative content. And it's not to say that any reboot or every reboot all revivals is going to be bad or terrible, but in terms of what movies are doing nowadays, I am getting a little tired of it. But in terms of this movie, well, yeah, this movie is really is no different. 
But in terms of what I've been hearing about this movie, it seems that instead of everyone, what I mean by everyone, I mean the media, talking more about the film itself, to production, and everything going on, mostly I've been hearing about things involving Holly Bailey and her being cast as Ariel. Now, because of this, ever since the ever since the casting has been announced, uh, there have been a lot of uh, voices all around about you know about the choice. And while there are people who are saying and absolutely praising the ideal of of Holly Bailey, who which by the way is African American, black, you know, uh, given the role. There are also other people who are not really for this. In fact, you probably ever heard of the hashtag not my aerial thing going on. But now on the other side, they're kind of countering this and calling this as being very racist. And also bringing up points that that apparently no black person can play a mermaid or even play a mermaid princess. So how I feel about this is that in ways, I don't think that the people who are not for this are racist. And I can actually understand where they're coming from. Because most of the people, at least some of the people I've seen, who are are not really for this film, are other blacks. So where do they fall into all this? And for reasons to why people are not really wanting to see a, uh, you know, see like this version of Ariel. It's due to the fact that Ariel have always, since since her debut in 1989, has always been this kind of way of being the uh, Caucasian looking, redhead, blue eyed uh, girl. Now, of course, you know, the biggest attribute is the fact that she is a green-tailed mermaid with red hair and, and a sing- great singing voice, and that is important. But I think at the end of all this, and once Holly's ba- Bailey's version come out, I feel like it might just come and go because, like I said, 1989's Little Mermaid has always been so iconic. So even if in a short period of time that people do love this, I don't think they're going to keep this permanently. And I don't think this version of Ariel is gonna like stay in people's minds forever. On the other side though too, people will kind of bring up the defense that, oh, well you wouldn't want Tiana to be played by a white person. But even with that, I'll, I'm gonna say that doesn't really work as a defense because in the context of the film, said it take place in the South and during the Jim Crow laws, 1920s, and starring a, uh, a, a black female lead, it kind of makes sense in terms of the story and the character of Tiana. Now, I would say though, is that if you, if they did want to, you know, change the race of characters, why they can do it with someone like Belle? And if you even look at the live action version, there are some black characters in that film. Not to mention the fact that uh, Tony Braxton also played Belle in their Broadway version. I think another example too that people like to bring up in terms of a switch of a, a, a white a white Disney princess being switched race will also be Cinderella played by Brandy. But even with that though too is not technically fully based on the animated version. 
uh lily lily uh okay her name kind of kind of escapes my mind right now but uh the lily actress who played the live action version of cinderella that film was more based on the animated movie but the one with brandy is more based off of rogers and hammerstein from the music and the story that's mostly based off that old broadway musical now something like the dress is very similar to the animated version but everything else is based on the broadway so therefore i can see them getting that pass But overall, um, especially for like, you know, other people like me, other blacks um, who are really questionable about this is the fact of this choice also feels almost pandering in a sense. Even some people say that it is also um, uh, kind of giving uh, Holly Bailey a, a hand-me-down. Now, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and I will go with the fact that, at least for now, go with the fact that the director wanted her based on her voice. I will give them the benefit of the doubt for that. But at least for me, I would feel, I just think that she would deserve more. She's a beautiful girl. She's very talented, great singing voice, acting on. I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of his, a lot of her acting, but I can see her playing a princess role. Uh, I can see her be, playing even a Disney princess. But with all that being said, it's worth a lot more when her, uh, her or anyone else has a role that's made for them an original character, as in Disney actually doing the research, going out, going to libraries or going online and looking up different mythologies, folk tales, any fairy tales around the world, take those and make into a into a film. Like have they done before. That to me will be a lot more powerful and have a bigger impact than just, you know, just, uh, you know, giving this, um, this, uh, giving her like the white character and just doing a, almost feel like a race swap. You don't have to agree with me, but um, I definitely like to know what people's opinion on this is. I also don't want to go to talk too much about this since there's a lot more facts to get into. For the rest of the film, I would say is that, yeah, this is going to be a pass for me. Not not just because the, the casting, but just because it's, like I said, it's a reboot, remake, retelling, live action, little thing. <laughs> yep. I would say I would, though, like to see a clip of the part of your world scene. I mean, it will have, it'll have little effects compared to everything else. It will be subtle. Um, I like part of your world. And like I said, she... Uh, Holly Bailey is has a very beautiful voice. That will be the one part I will actually would like to see and probably will enjoy. But I can I can do with it without everything else, especially a CGI Sebastian. No, no, put it put it away, put it away. No, 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 <laughs> no. Okay, as you can see, I'm almost done. So as I said before, this is kind of like my own version of The Little Mermaid. But it's also based on Caribbean and African folklore. Especially it's based on the mythology of Mamiwata. For The Mermaid herself, in terms of her design, I based her look on Holly Bailey and especially her hair, in which case she has like those long braids. In terms of the outfit that she's wearing, uh, the top part is almost kind of like a wrapped around cloth. In the tail itself, it's similar to almost like Ariel's tail, which is like a greenish blue. But I really want to emphasize it being very elemental, aquatic looking, as if she's really is part of the ocean. 
To make her stand out even more, I also put like some uh, magical marks on her. Now, in terms of the prints, I was really trying to figure out what I wanted him to look like. So I went back, did some more research, and I ended up finding out that in during the Haitian Revolutionary War, uh, there was actually a the leader, a prince by the name of Henry Christophe. I was really digging the um, outfit that he was wearing, so I, I kind of put that um, put that onto my character for the prince. The look itself, I kind of was going for more of a the weekend kind of facial look. I didn't add any uh, animal sidekicks. However, though, I did add a character into this uh, who happens to be a priestess to the ocean spirit. And she kind of ends up serving as a guide and a potential friend for the mermaid uh, main character. Since this is supposed to be mostly based on the Hans Christian Andersen's um, uh, fairy tale, I decided to have a mother figure or a mother character for the main character be Yamaya, Mother of the Sea. So he's kind of a replacement for King Triton. And for the villain, I was originally going to have a witch character. And his witch character is actually going to be based on a Caribbean mythical being called the Sukoyant. But as I was going forward, I was very more attracted to one of the characters from the musical Once on this Island. Which, by the way, was an, another influence for me wanting to do this uh, art piece. Very similar to The Little Mermaid, but with a more Caribbean twist to it. I recommend checking out or learning more about it. But here is a character by the name of Papa Guy, who is kind of a more of a voodoo god, similar to the god of death. So, looking things up, I was able to find some mythologies in African folklore and culture that actually involves creatures similar to mermaids. So, in one of them, in African diaspora, there is a creature known as Mamiwata, spirit of the water. Now, don't get triggered by that. Mammy Wata just means mother water. And is actually celebrated throughout Africa and African Atlantic. She's often portrayed as a mermaid, a snake charmer, or a combination of both. And she actually has expanded origins. And she has been influenced by representations in ancient and indigenous African water spirits. Hindu gods and goddesses, and European mermaids. And in fact, during the time of the enslavement of Africans, the story of Mamiwata actually spread to different places and different communities, all in different names, including La Siren, Yenmanja, Santa Marta, La Dominadora, and Oxen. And this has spread not just from the Americas in Africa, but also in Haiti, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic. Now also as well, the Mammy spirit, or as they call the sisters, also represents waters of life departure, and return. For the Africans, these waters are represented of the ultimate journey back home and all those distant yet living ancestors. In Haiti, it is a journey home to Guinea across the rippling boundary of existence. 
and imagined as a vast expanse of water that exists between life and the afterlife. So you see, this water spirit represents hope as well as home, or the journey to home. The Mami Uwata actually even traced all the way back to the early civilization in Africa. For almost more than 4,000 years ago, the Mesopotamian myths also tell a great water goddess in their story of the creation known as Mami Aruru, as the creators of life. Now, some of the stories of Mami Wata is actually similar to stories about sirens, in which case one of them being is that her followers come to shore every now and then to capture sailors and fishermen and to take them to the water kingdom. The captives were a source of entertainment until they were offered as sacrifice to her. The Memiwata has such a powerful presence in the culture that she even has trained priestesses who serve as a link between people and their deity. While Memiwata is also known as the water spirit, she is also the goddess of fertility and protector of women and children. She definitely has a soft spot for women who have suffered in abuse. She's also a provider of wealth and riches to her loyal worshippers and admirers and blesses children with beauty. But surprisingly enough though, as much as she does have some good and moral traits, there's also some evil traits as well. Many men have been said to be captured by a deity for her own sexual satisfaction. Sometimes these men are left lifeless to be buried by the living, or their bodies are just never found again. And women who are not humble because they have been blessed with beauty are often left barren or without a man until they compensate to the deity. And in Western civilization, specifically in the Caribbean and Southern America, it's been said that Mami Wata has traveled with them on the Atlantic Ocean, protecting them and taking some of their pain to relieve them. Once again, going back to the history of slave trade, she has been with them through their journeys serving as her guide and protector. One story that actually does connect to Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid is when a fisherman was actually rescued by La Serene, who used all her strength to carry him back to his boat. The fisherman had sang to her as that was the only offering he had to the water spirit. Now, Mami Wata, Yamaja, La Serene, these have been stories that have been told in African and Caribbean culture for centuries. But they're also not the only stories on Black Mermaids. Other stories on Black Mermaids include Suki and the Mermaid, written by Robert D. Sun Suki. There's also Mermaid Dreams by Kate Pugsley, Ellie and the Secret Potion by Gillian Shields, Mermaid Tales, written by Debbie Daddy. There's some mermaid stories in the book Her Stories, told by Virginia Hamilton. There's also the Mermaid Twin Sisters, written by Lynn Joseph, Rise of the Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. Julian is a Mermaid by Jessica Love, and more. Well, here it is, folks. My own little version of The Little Mermaid, with a more Caribbean Afro twist to it. I hope you enjoyed this video, as well as my drawing. 
but I also hope you got some interesting information about the mythology of mermaids, the history of the Little Mermaid story, as well as some other worldly tales. In fact, I would also even recommend checking out your local library or doing some online research on different mythologies, as well as other folk tales around the world. But now I want to know what you think about this. What are your thoughts on the Disney remake of The Little Mermaid? What's your thoughts on the casting? If there is any retelling of a classic story given a more cinematic treatment, what would it be? i love to hear what you guys think. Also, if you're new and would like to be part of the Mad Town community, hit the subscribe button. If you like this video, hit the like button. And make sure to share with friends and family, as well as checking out our other social media sites. I will catch you folks for the next video. Until then, you folks stay happy and healthy. Peace. Hey everyone, this is Jordan from Mad Town Studios. I hope you enjoyed this video. I will be putting up new content each month down below in the comments if you have any questions for me or if you have any uh, recommendations of what I should draw, please let me know. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more updates from Madtown Studios, tap that subscribe button down below. Well, see you next time. Peace.